All rise. Hear ye, hear ye, hear ye. Supreme Court of Florida is now in session. All we have called to plead, draw near. Give attention, you shall be heard. God save the United States, the great state of Florida, and his honorable court. Florida Supreme Court. The first case on our docket this morning is Trotty versus Rick Scott Governor. Mr. Potavano. Good morning and may it please the court. I'm Phil Potavano of the firm of Brannock and Humphreys for the petitioner David Trotty. Uh, with me at council to, uh, table this morning is Joe Eagleton also of Brannock and Humphreys and Mr. Robert Slama of Jacksonville. Mr. Slama was uh, counsel in both of the proceedings below in the DCA and in the in the uh, circuit court. After hearing the evidence in this case, the trial judge said, and I quote, this was simply an effort to circumvent the Constitution, not to support, protect, and defend it. Uh, judge Foster uh, resigned before the qualifying in the 2018 general election period, but he set his resignation date, the effective date, nine months in the future to appoint just four days before the end of the natural expiration of his term. And of course, there was no reason for him to resign in the first place. He, he couldn't qualify for another term. Mr. Why Pompano, he didn't, may, may I interrupt I'm sorry. just to, to try to get cut to the heart yes. of really what, what we're talking about here. The jurisprudence of this court has interpreted uh, uh, the uh, uh, resignation uh, as being effective when accepted, isn't it? That's correct. So we, in this case, then what we would have to do is overrule a number of, of cases uh, to get to the, the point where, uh, where you would like us to I, be. I don't think so, Your Honor, and let me tell you why. Um, and, and I think it would be helpful to start with the points where I believe that we agree. We agree that there is a body of case law in this court that says a resignation becomes effective when it is tendered and accepted by the governor. We also agree that this court has encouraged lawyers, uh, excuse me, judges, to, to resign in the future so that the work of the nominating commissions can be done and so that there will be a seamless transition uh, in the service of the court. Well, there, there's a hole in the constitutional framework, isn't there? I, th I think, I think. It doesn't I think, really describe exactly what happens. I think not. I think these cases, Your Honor, basically or were, they were founded on a principle of good faith, that a resignation was actually going to be a resignation in the near future. Every one of the cases that you refer to, every one of them, the effective date of the resignation occurred before the general election. And in the first case in which it occurred, it, it involved the resignation of Judge Richard Fuller. Um, and, the, and I think the resignation was before the qualifying, but after the, uh, after the after the qualifying had been concluded, but it was, I think, something on the order of July 31st or maybe even September, and the court said, well, because there's going to be six or seven months of nobody in the office, that is what we call an unreasonable vacancy. Uh, and they used the term in that, the court used the term in that case, unreasonable vacancy. All of the other cases fall in that category. So what I'm saying to you, uh, Justice Lewis, is I don't think that the court needs to modify its case law. I think that the court, all the court needs to say is that when it decided those cases, it was contemplating a near-term uh, resignation. It did, I don't think the court had in mind that somebody was going to make a mockery of this by resigning a day before the end of the term and completely swallow up an entire election in the interim. I don't think that is what the court had in mind. So I don't uh, really well, it's not really what, what, what the court has in mind or any well, politician you know, has in mind. It I, is, I mean, it's a question of trying to apply what the Constitution right, tells right. us. Right. Th I think that this case is directly controlled by the case that the court decided in Spectre v. Glisson. But Spectre, the, the Constitution has changed in Spectre. 
The Constitution did change, Your Honor, but not in a material way. Certainly the Constitution did change in some respects. The Constitution changed in the respect that, for the most, most notably, that we no longer elect appellate judges. Back then we were electing Florida Supreme Court justices. Uh, the Constitution changed in the respect that we have a, we now have a, uh, a, a longer period for an interim appointment than we had. Uh, well, actually, that changed several times since then, I think. But the material part of Specter has not changed one bit. The material part of Specter is if there is an election, the will of the people must be honored and we must have the election. Here, you have a case where there was absolutely no reason not to hold an election. Am, am I correct in understanding that under the scenario that we sanctioned in or authorized in uh, Inspector, uh, there was going to be no uh, uh, physical vacancy in the office. That's correct. That's correct. And I think, Un unlike, I'm, so I'm sorry, unlike what would obtain here, yes, there would yes. actually be it's small, but there would be some physical vacancy. In yes, the Your office. Honor. I can so see, that's a that's a distinction. Yes, Your Honor. I concede. I concede that is a difference. Let, let me let me ask you another thing. Uh, that I think is related to Spectre. Let me give you a hypothetical. Uh, say that today, uh, or, or earlier this year, there was a circuit judge with a term expiring in January of 2021. Okay? And that uh, circuit judge decided um, that she wanted to leave office before the expiration of her term. Actually, quite a bit before the expiration of her term. Say about two years before the expiration of her term. But she also decided uh, that she would like for her successor to be chosen by election rather than by appointment. So she announced uh, in 2018, before the start of qualifying period, that she would retire effective uh, on the first Tuesday after the first Monday in January 2019. Mm -hmm. Under your theory of our Constitution, what would happen? I believe if I understand your hypothetical correctly, it would be an election. And I believe if I understand it correctly, that's precisely what happened, Inspector. But, but so you if, think that, if the, if if, the, so you think the, the judge there could, could decide that there's going to be a special election under the, the way the Constitution is now? What I think, Your Honor, is that there's a big difference between deciding to follow the will of the people and to hold an election in an election year than deciding to try to thwart that. There's a big difference between those two things. But justice the is about a special election. Well, correct? Justice Justice Irvin of this court, one might make the same criticism of Justice Irvin of this court. He did. I'm it, not so criticizing. I know anybody. you're not criticizing. I'm just, I'm just, I'm just trying to explore where your right. theory of all this takes us, uh, because what was involved in Specter was a special election that was set at the time of the regularly scheduled election, but it was still a special election for that seat, correct? Correct. And the scenario I just gave you involved a special election for uh, a, a circuit court seat, correct? Well, I'm sorry, I missed the last point. Was it a, so the scenario I described, the hypothetical here would have involved, you're saying okay. there should be a special election for that circuit court seat. Right. But I think there's a difference between, between like for example, if a circuit judge might, uh, might announce to the bar, I don't choose to run again, to let everybody know that the seat will be open, w one might characterize that as a conscious choice on the part of the judge to favor an election. But elections are the default. But what you're saying, you're election, this is an election. But what, if in your response to my hypothetical, you're saying that basically the, the judge can decide there's going to be a special election to, to fill out a two-year portion of the judge's term, correct? I, I don't know. Perhaps I don't understand precisely the, the hypothetical. I, I don't I'm understand. Really well, getting, well, what don't you understand about it? I thought it was, well, I mean, I tried to be clear. I, I, sometimes I, I, I fail. I, I, I'm, I'm not laying that on you, Justice Kennedy. I'm just, <laughs> <laughs> believe me, I'm not. <laughs> but uh, if, if, I mean, in any event, we have a general election here. This is a general election year. It's 2018. Well, I understand. That, was, that also was the case in Spectre, but it was nonetheless a special election for that particular seat. It was not, the, t the term was not up. So there was not going to be an election for that seat. And in the scenario I gave you, the term would not be up. 
it would be a special election. If I understand yeah. you correctly, you're saying the I, judge, I think, I think I, the I, judge I, can decide, as inspector, the judge can decide that there will be a special election. I, I think I understand you better now, and I'm not sure I would answer that question by saying that it is an election, because that's a different situation, I think a very different situation from what we have here. This is How's it different than Spectre? This is too, well, Spectre actually was, if I, he, he actually was aging out, I think, 20 days after. So he wouldn't have qualified for that, uh, I mean, he wouldn't, I guess he could have. I guess he could have. It's true. He, would, he, he was going to be out by mandatory retirement, but the term was not up right. otherwise. That's correct. That's correct. So it had right. to be a special election if it was going to be filled by election, correct? Well, there was a general election that year. It was a general election year. I'm not sure what the significance of the special I mean, there was a, that was an election year. It was 1974. And there was, in fact, a general election that year. Candidates for the Supreme Court, in fact, some did. I believe Arthur England did. Some of them did qualify for that, tried to. Well, let me ask you this. This, in, in our case, the letter was sent by Judge Foster prior to the qualification Correct. period, right? But it was to his term, by his terms, was to end way after the qualifying period. That's correct. What would be the result if he had sent his letter a week, a day, a week, whatever, after the qualifying period? Would there be an election here or would we still be fighting about whether or not there would be an appointment? That, that would clearly be an election. And that goes to part of this. So, so we, we do get to the point where a judge can, by the date of the letter that is sent to the governor, determine whether there is going to be an election or an appointment. Right. And what, that's correct. And what I'm saying is I don't think that uh, it reflects well on the judiciary or that it's consistent with the general, with, with, the, with the rule this court announced, Inspector, to deliberately resign before the qualifying begins knowing that, knowing that that will create an appointment when in fact you intend to stay there for the entire year. Let, let me ask you this, what, what in your view is a reasonable vacancy? The court... I mean, so if he had sent this letter and said that I'm leaving at the end of October, would that be by appointment according to your theory? I, I think it would be by appointment, yes sir. Okay, so, uh, and, and so but the judge could do that subjectively to make it an appointment. Yes. So, the, the, so the, the, your, your concern is not really with the subjective intent, it's with the length of time? I think that's, I think that's correct. I think, I, I think that's correct, Your let, Honor. Let I, me ask you this too. Uh, looking at the 2006 unanimous advisory opinion from this court, it says that under prior case law, a vacancy occurred in that case when you, the governor, received and accepted Judge Stevenson's resignation. And that's the point of law that you agree with and say should remain, correct? That's correct. Okay. And then it goes on to say, because the qualifying period for the seat had not commenced, under this court's decision, in, and it gives the, the letter, the election process has not yet begun. Thus, Article 5, Section 11B controls and the vacancy shall be filled by appointment. That was, that is all correct. But now, it's a if, if we were to follow that, then this would be a, an appointed position, correct? But the difference, and it is a big difference, is that involved an actual vacancy, a fairly long term, I forget exactly how long, but I know. But that, that wasn't part of the reasoning, was it? Well, part of the reasoning in the previous case involving Judge Fuller talked about the fact that it had to be done that way because there would otherwise it was be a an seven month. It was a seven month vacancy. Yeah, I mean, it. because it would, yes, Your Honor, it would, because it would otherwise be uh, an unreasonable vacancy. To go back to your earlier question, I don't think the court defined what an unreasonable vacancy was, but uh, I think that's probably a good argument for saying that the court doesn't need to, de time, de to define what is too short a time. Let me ask a question just about the practicalities of this case and our precedent. Obviously, I agreed with you with your dissent in the prior Trotty case. Uh, it does the whole way we our law has developed, including whether the vacancy or the letter is accepted before the qualifying period or right after, again creates an arbitrariness. Uh, so to me, I see that this has, should, whether it's solved legislatively, constitutionally, or by this court. 
But in this situation, it does concern me that we've got the alternatives we have is a judge who uh, was uh, is in the wings, uh, Judge Bass, who was uh, went through a judicial nominating commission process with, I assume, other qualified people, and we had uh, the, the uh, governor ap appointing him, and yet we've got Mr. Trotty, who apparently, this is, you know, he was, I guess, the same Trotty. Uh, nobody else put in for the, for the seat, presumably because they were relying on precedent. So it concerns me from a, from a practical point of view that the choices here, at least here, but going forward, it may be different, is that we should stick with our precedent and let this go by appointment and prospectively, if depending on what, you know, make sure this doesn't continue to happen. Uh, what do you say about the fact that in, if, if the policy is we favor elections, there wasn't any election here? Well, um, I, what I say about that is there was an election. If the Constitution calls for an election, it calls for an election whether one person qualifies or whether 10 people qualify. And I would also say that there is a provision in the Florida law that says what happens when only one person qualifies, and that is the person is deemed to have voted for himself or herself and is deemed in, is not No, is I not understand. I, I'm just saying so, the reality is that we had one process yes. that was a full process and another that I mean, I'm sure, I would assume I, there are more people in the Fourth Circuit that would like to be a circuit I, court I judge. Think that's, I think that's right. I think to answer your broader question, and it gets to a problem in this case, we're advocating for elections, and yet there won't be a contested election. There is an election under the law, but there won't be a contested election. I understand that concern. Let me just say, and that's a concern that the First District ex uh, expressed, but let me just say that I think that that once this problem is resolved, if the court were to say, we are going to adhere to what we said, Inspector, that if there is a machinery for electing, we're going to follow that because that is the will of the people. If lawyers out there get the idea that the court is willing to support the constitutional right to an election, then this isn't going to happen so often in the future. It has happened every year, as I pointed out, every election cycle, because in the first Trotty case, they gave lawyers the green light to do it. But, and it should come as no surprise to the First District Court of Appeal that there isn't much interest in elections. Uh, so, Mr. but I think Mr. the Mr. problem you that- Mr. you are consuming your rebuttal yes, time. I, I, if you want to keep going, you certainly no, may. No, I do not, I'll, but- uh, I will give you an extra minute. Uh, well, thank you, Your Honor. Thank, thank you for reminding me. May it please the court, Dan Nordby on behalf of Governor Scott, and with me at council's table is Meredith Sasso, Chief Deputy Counsel for Governor Scott. Can I just say a few things that still concern me about our definitions and our past jurisprudence? Okay, the vacancy occurring at the time that the resignation is accepted, yet an actual vacancy in this case and in the more recent cases will only be a matter of a day, two days, three days. There seems to be something unintended with that, uh, that somebody that, that, although we understand maybe a month or whatever, what, is that a set of law? Is that through the Constitution? Or has that been something that the court has created? Could you just, on the issue of when a vacancy occurs? Sure, Justice Perriente. I think that is very long settled law. I think actually Specter versus Glisson announced that principle that the vacancy occurred at the time the resignation is tendered and accepted by the governor. It's also consistent with, uh, I believe it's chapter 114 of the Florida statutes, which says that a resignation occurs when, uh, when the resignation is tendered and accepted. But when have we talked, in what cases have we talked about an actual vacancy? Because here, Judge Foster, who couldn't serve another term, I mean, that's undisputed. It's been sitting and con will continue to sit until a couple of days before the end of his term. Well, Justice Parente, in the, uh, in the 1992 advisory opinion um, involving Judge Fuller, and then uh, I think more specifically in the 2006 advisory opinion, the Sheriff and Judicial Vacancies advisory opinion from 2006 
involved a resignation that was tendered before the qualifying period and effective after the qualifying period. And in that case as well, this court held to its precedent that the, the effective date of the vacancy is the date when it's accepted rather than the, the date that it becomes effective at some later point. Right. Well, we, that, in that case, though, there was a true, um, the, the, he was uh, resigning effective uh, May 31st. So there was a seven month vacancy, an actual vacancy. The other question I have, and then uh, I, I know I stopped you at the beginning, is this idea, and I think it came from advisory opinion, is that if the resignation becomes accepted before the beginning of the qualifying period, it goes by appointment. But if it is after uh, the qualifying period, it's by election. And I believe that was an advisory opinion. I believe there was either at least one dissent. What is that, what is the rationale, and again, the court would have enunciated it, for what again seems to be a very arbitrary deadline when you know there are, is, are mo there's months ahead that there is going to be either, you know, an election, and so you'd have to have senior judges in one case, and in another, you know, you could fill it right away. It says that from a, from, since we're concerned about the administration of justice, if the Constitution doesn't specifically speak to it, does that make sense to you? Well, let me, let me address both your questions in turn, Justice Perriente. First on the, the question of the length of the actual vacancy, and picking up on something Justice Lawson mentioned in, uh, in the earlier questioning, this court has not looked uh, as part of its rationale in these cases as to the length of the actual vacancy. And specifically in the 2002 advisory opinion, when this court involuntarily retired Judge Harley here on the Leon County Court during the qualifying period, this court determined that that seat should be filled through the elections process, notwithstanding the fact that Judge Harley was involuntarily retired effective at midnight that same day, resulting in an eight-month actual vacancy in office. Notwithstanding the eight-month actual vacancy, this court said that the election process should continue because the election process had begun. So appointments have happened in cases where there are seven-month actual vacancies. Elections have happened in cases where there are eight-month vacancies. I guess it sounds and to me like the jurisprudence has created something that is not very jurisprudentially sound is what I'm seeing here. That's, that's my point, is that we have an opportunity to, clar to make sure going forward that the system can't be manipulated because again and it's not judge moran did it uh, uh, several judges they all in their heart believe that merit re selection is a better system as do i uh over election uh, and i very but but the question is the voters have rejected that for trial judges and haven't we created by our jurisprudence an unintentional uh, uh whole where the system can be manipulated. So, so let me address the, the broader question. We, as we've laid out in our brief, the, the Constitution provides that when vacancies occur in office, that vacancies are filled by the governor. Um, and that's what the Constitution says. Now, this court, in its 2002 advisory opinion, uh, stated that there is an exception to that after the election process has begun. Justice Lewis dissented from that opinion, as I recall, saying that he didn't see the language, the election process in the Constitution. But that, that's what, uh, what led us to where we are now. And this, I think there's a, a policy rationale for that. Uh, this, this court said in the 2002 case, that was a vacancy after the qualifying period. Candidates were running for office, and in fact, we were on the eve of an election. And this court said, well, under those circumstances, maybe it doesn't make sense to allow the governor, governor to appoint and nullify an ongoing election. So in the 2002 case, the vacancy occurred after candidate qualifying, and this court said the election process should continue. In the 2006 advisory opinion, the sheriff and judicial vacancies opinion, the vacancy occurred before the candidate qualifying period under very similar timing to the vacancy here, an April resignation uh, for an office that would have been elected that November anyway, and there were candidates who wanted to run for that office. And this court said, well, the Constitution requires vacancies to be filled by the governor, and the qualifying period hasn't happened yet. The election process has not begun. And then as I mentioned, the 2008 opinion, the vacancy occurred during the qualifying period. And this court said, we're, we're not going to look to facts that are specific to each election cycle to determine how this process should 
be carried out. We're going to look to objective criteria. When did the vacancy occur? Was it before or after the beginning of the statutory qualifying period? So we don't need to look at the length of the vacancy, the specific needs of any trial court, the subjective motivations of the retiring judge. Was it before or after the qualifying period? So I think there's, there's at least one rationale for that sort of approach being taken. But should the, but is, is there a problem with the language that says that the vacancy occurs when you send the letter as opposed to the date that you have indicated in that letter that you will be actually leaving, which would really uh, result in a real vacancy as opposed to a, a theoretical uh, vacancy. Well, Justice Quince, I don't think that, uh, that we have a disagreement with our friends here as to that line of precedent, and that has existed since uh, at least Specter versus Glisson, and, and is consistent with the language of Article 10, Section 3, and Chapter 114 of the Florida Statutes. And what that allows is for the judicial nominating process to begin, to result in nominations, and to result in an appointment for a, for a seamless transition so, from one judge to another. But, but on the other hand, I mean, I know uh, circuit and county court elections are a little different from the, the, the appellate process, but in an appellate situation, generally, um, you know, you get to the, if someone gets to the end of their term, such as Judge Foster would have at the end of his uh, aging out, um, the process starts because the Constitution requires you know, the, at least 60 days uh, before the actual vacancy. And so why isn't that just as a, a good a process to have in the circuit court situation? Uh, well, J Justice Quince, I think there could be different policy arguments about what a, a better system was. I know Justice Perriente's concurring opinion in the Pinkett case from two years ago suggested maybe a clarifying constitutional amendment would be one way to address this. But as a matter of current precedent and the current constitutional language, uh, I don't think that there's any dispute that a vacancy occurred before the qualifying period. And this court has said in every such circumstance that vacancies occurring before candidate qualifying are filled by the appointment process. What, what is the executive uh, branch's view? Uh, if we would, would have a circumstance and, and, and this court uh, would say, well, we've created a, a law, jurisprudence that talks that, that's really a theoretical vacancy. It's not a real vacancy. And uh, certainly you can't stop judges, uh, other officers from resigning. I mean, that's part of you know, what happens. But the, the Constitution uh, does not provide for uh, uh, a year's wait time. It's not constitutionally enshrined. That's something that we've allowed to occur. So what would be the, the, the executive branch's view if, if, if a court would say, well, you know, the, the vacancy, this court has said that it occurs when, when it's tendered and accepted, and uh, individual judges do not have the power to subvert the will of the people expressed in the Constitution. And it's not what, what we want, what you as lawyers want, it's what the Constitution says. And although I may prefer, uh, 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 as, as many do, uh, uh, a merit retention system, we don't have it for our trial judges. So what, what would be the executive's uh, uh, response to uh, an opinion uh, or a thought that, or an argument that would say, we should not let judges or politicians manipulate what the Constitution has clearly set forth, and that is, that it occurs when, when tendered and, and accepted. Well, Justice Lewis, two responses to that. One more on the law and one more of a practical response. Sure. Uh, so on the, on the law, the Constitution does provide for a merit selection process to fill vacancies at the trial court level in Article 5, Section 11. Okay. Uh, and, and that's the circumstance here, is, is to fill a, a vacancy in office for a limited term, for a, a two to three year term, followed by an election for a full term. The more practical consequence is that we've not seen any argument from, uh, from Mr. Trotty at any level about what rule he's asking this court to adopt that would not allow a judge to resign in a way that would ensure an appointment or an election uh, of his or her successor. If this court were to say well, that... Well, because, I mean, the, that we're talking in terms of what's theoretical, that that's a, a vacancy, but it's not really a vacancy. It is that letter says, I'm not going to leave until a day before my term expires. 
But, but Justice Lewis, if, if this court were to say that a, a vacancy could not be effective until after the general election or in December and have that well, filled by appointment. How about say you can't fix it? That, that if you want to resign, go ahead and resign and the terms of the resignation become effective as the Constitution says that when accepted by the, the executive. Well, I, I think that actually was something that, uh, that Mr. Trotty suggested on page 30 of his brief, that this court find that uh, resignations effective in the future are unconstitutional. I think that would be a dramatic departure from this court's precedent to require well, only immediate resignations. Well, I, I don't know it's unconstitutional. What prohibits that? Oh, I, I don't believe that it does. I don't believe that anything in the Constitution does that. The petitioner suggested that on page 30 of his brief that this court might decide that resignations effective too far in the future are unconstitutional. But those have happened throughout this, well, this no, state's it's, history. It's, it would be effective as of the date given. Uh, you know, to, to me, it's an affront to the people of Florida to have judges and that, that can manipulate the heart of who we are as a democracy. That's our Constitution. And I think what the trial judge here had to say is that's what this is doing. And I'm, I'm, I'm looking to see if, if there's not some other legally sound so, but but a, 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 a better way. So just, just so I can understand, so Justice Lewis, your suggestion is that if a judge wants to resign, that resignation must be effective immediately? It cannot be delayed? Right. If the resignation of Judge Foster had happened effective immediately in April, if that were the result, then I don't think there's any question under this court's jurisprudence that that vacancy would have been filled by appointment Fine. rather so than by the election process. So be it. Uh, my, my problem is with the charade that's being played. He's not really resigning. Let's face would, it. Would, would, wouldn't, the, wouldn't the problem with such a rule be that it would, uh, that would make every resignation uh, effective immediately? So you turn in your resignation, it's effective, you're out of the door. Um, that would essentially guarantee that there will be probably at least a two to three month physical vacancy before the process, uh, the merit selection process and appointment process can can do its work. I, I think that's absolutely right as a practical matter, and it could even be a, a five or six month vacancy if someone appointed well, we, from private we have practice. have senior judges and the legislature has provided for those, and there are, let me tell you, there are uh, hundreds of senior judges around the state that, that there's not the senior judge hours for them. So why not uh, plug those in until whatever you need? Well, again, Justice Lewis, that would be contrary to a number of opinions from this court suggesting that judges should resign effective in the future to allow for a seamless transition. Well, I'm not sure there's, there's a reason soundly uh, to say that, oh, the courts are overworked and they can't do this. You know, they have been up here 20 years. And in watching what's happening now with, with what's going on in the trial court system, I, I respectfully, I just can't see why senior judge uh, uh, individuals could not, I mean, more than adequately uh, handle that. I mean, we, we approve all the senior judges. They come through our, you know, through our uh, conferences. And, and it's pages and pages and pages of them. Uh, rather than, my, my concern is, is that the people think this is a laughable situation. Only lawyers could say, you have a vacancy when the letter comes in, but you don't have a vacancy until 10 months later because, because one judge decided that's what he or she was going to do. Well, Justice Lewis, if, if this court were to say that Judge Foster's resignation should be deemed to be effective immediately as to, uh, as to on April 23rd when it was accepted by Governor Scott, then the result of this case would be to affirm the first district right. on other no, grounds through that. the appointment process. But we're talking about uh, trying to find what, what's a rational and reasonable reading of the Florida Constitution as to how it should operate when people resign? That, that's, that's really what we're talking about this morning. And, is it? Uh, Mr. And Norby, uh, just one question, and uh, I'm asking this because I don't know. Is it possible for someone to withdraw a resignation? Uh, well, what's the effect? If I, I change my mind, Governor, I don't want to resign anymore. I still have six months left in my term. Uh, Justice Laborga, I think under this court's precedent, uh, it is possible to withdraw a resignation up until the point that it has been accepted by the governor. Um, okay. 
And how does the governor actually accept the resignation? It, by the convening of the Judicial Nominating Commission, or does the governor send a letter back saying, I accept your letter of resignation? How the the latter, happen? the latter. The governor sends a letter, accept formally a written letter, accepting the resignation, and then separate correspondence asking the Judicial Nominating Commission so there, to convene. So there could not be a situation where I resign, the governor convenes the JNC, people are nominated, he makes an appointment, I don't like the appointment, judge, I withdraw my resignation. I still got six months left in my term. I think that's right, Justice Labarga, and actually that was addressed in Specter versus Glisson, whether Justice Urban's resignation should be deemed to be uh, irrevocable, mm -hmm. and I think this court concluded that it, it was properly deemed irrevocable. Let me ask you, qu on this, dealing with this case, so uh, there is a judicial candidate who's been nominated and is serving a, at this point as a county court judge. Uh, if we agree with your position, either by coming up with what Justice Lewis has suggested or going with uh, the first district, uh, then he would be uh, up, have to run for election uh, in 2020. Is that correct? That's right. If uh, uh, the governor so, has announced his intent to appoint Judge County Judge Lester Bass to the seat, if uh, this court will permit it, so it would be so he would serve for a, a year. And I'm just doing the math. It's right. he, about he would, a year. He would, he would serve until the next general election. That's more than a year away. So that would be the 2020. I guess August, presumably 2020. General when election. and then election. I mean, so what? So the other. So we understand too. This only appears to occur when these, well, I'm going to call manipulations of recent, good motivated, you know, intentions, uh, occur in the even numbered years. Is really in the, when a vacancy occurs in an odd number year, because uh, I always have to try to explain why some get uh, selected through merit selection and others elected, there, there is no question that in those cases, those seats are filled by merit selection. Is that correct? I, I think that's right. I, I can't think of a counterexample of that. This seems to come up in, in even numbered years. And in cases really recently where everybody can't even, they can't even run again. I mean, so this isn't even, that's why these, these two or three situations that have come up have come up not where somebody is sick or, you know, is in, unqualified, but where they intentionally are leaving two or three days before the end of their term. Uh, I mean, that's, I think, I think that's we true. haven't it's, had that. I think that's under, true in some cases. Um, well, I don't, again, the cases in the recent years are all that situation, correct? Uh, yes, we've also had judges, though, who, who leave and submit a resignation effective the end of December after the candidate qualifying period. And in those cases, the election process Well, continues. then, again, that goes back to what Justice Lewis had right. dissented, is to say, where do we come up with that one? Right. So, uh, but, yeah, but we, so we created another arbitrary distinction. Right. And, and, and so what we would ask this court to say, uh, consistent with the 2006 advisory opinion in the sheriff and judicial vacancies case, um, is that to any attorneys, uh, such as Mr. Trotty, who wish to run for this office, uh, the seat will be up in two years. If they want to run, uh, they can, it's a limited initial appointment, and they can run for that seat. I did want to respond, well, I, my time is up. I wanted Since to, I'm going to give opposing counsel an extra minute, I'll give you an extra minute. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, just to Justice Lewis's earlier point about uh, Specter versus Glisson and some of the uh, issues that have changed since then, I think that the most important difference uh, between now and Specter versus Glisson legally is the adoption of the 1996 amendment to the Constitution. Specter versus Glisson had as one of its central premises that the people wanted vacancies filled through the election process at the earliest possible opportunity. By extending the initial appointed term for up to two years beyond the closest election in 1996, I think the people undermined that premise of Specter, and, uh, and that's another reason why Specter should be legally distinguishable. I, I do have one other question. A am I correct that the issues that we've been discussing were decided in the 2014 first DCA case, Trotty 1? I, I, yes. Okay. And am I correct that the parties at, in 2014 sought review in this court and it was not granted? That's correct. And what was the legal issue actually in the case that we're currently here on today? Uh, we believe the legal issues and, the, and largely the factual link issues are largely indistinguishable between the 2014 Trotty case. And well, there was a big difference. Wasn't, wasn't the issue whether the trial judge erred in granting a preliminary injunction? 
the, the vehicle was slightly different in the two cases. In the 2014 case, Mr. Trotty sought a petition for a writ of mandamus. That was denied by the Circuit Court and denied by the First District Court of Appeal. In this case, a declaratory judgment was sought. It was granted by the trial court and then reversed by the First District Court of Appeal. So procedurally, there is a am difference. Am I incorrect? Because maybe I'm misreading it. But I, I, I read the case that we're here on is simply holding that because of the 2014 opinion, Mr. Trotty could not show a substantial likelihood of success on the merits, and therefore an injunction was incorrect. So that the court did not re-decide any of the issues that were decided in 2014. They just determined in this case, the holding was that the trial court was bound by that case. Is that an inaccurate summary of the case that we're actually talking about today? Justice Lawson, I think it's accurate, and that's the, the view we expressed in our jurisdictional briefing. Okay. So we would ask this court to either discharge jurisdiction as, as improvidently granted or to affirm the First District's decision. To go to a point that counsel made near the end about the 96th Amendment, that all that did was it lengthened the term of an interim appointment, but it didn't make it more permanent. It didn't uh, change the relationship between Article 5, Section 10 and Article 5, Section 11. And I have, I would like to just read you one line from Ployce versus Christ, Justice Labargo's opinion in Ployce versus Christ, citing Specter. This is 2009, long after the 2006 Amendment. The nominating commission process is really a restraint upon the governor, not a new process of removing from the people their traditional right to elect their judges. It goes on to quote it, uh, it goes on to quote at length, Specter v. Glisson, every member of this court signed that opinion, with the exception, of course, of Justice Lawson, who is not here then. Uh, let me make one other point about, I, if I could focus, maybe focus in a little bit on the, the, the difficulty we're having here. I don't think we disagree about the body of law that says a vacancy is created if the resignation occurs before the qualifying. The problem is, what is a vacancy? Is this a vacancy? Would you be satisfied? The, the trial judge said this was an artificial vacancy. I think that's a good way to put it. Uh, and my question to you is, would you be satisfied if somebody resigned, if a circuit judge resigned 15 minutes before midnight, effective 15 minutes before midnight on the last day of his or her term, no work is being done, the courthouse is not even open, but now we're gonna have to blindly and reflexively follow this rule that says, well, you know, the judge submitted the resignation before the qualifying. There isn't any real difference between that example and what has occurred here. There isn't any real difference between that and Specter. Specter didn't, Specter didn't turn on the fact that Justice Irvin resigned in the last day or the day before or the week before. The whole point of Specter was that there was an intervening election and that the citizens had a right to, 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 to elect their Supreme Court justice in that election. So, would, would, so you, I, would you also agree that the issues that we're talking about were decided by the panel that you were on in 2014 in the first Trotty case? They, they, they were, but I disagree that this was okay. merely a, 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 a and, and that would you agree that the issue on appeal, as stated in the opinion that we're here on, is whether the trial court erred in granting a, an injunction on the basis that there was no substantial the, likelihood of success. The, the trial was that, court. Is, the that trial the way court the, is that the way the court framed the issue in the opinion that we're here on? No. The trial court really? fully reached the merits of the issue all over again. The trial court said that it was. I'm talking about the I, appellate I know, opinion. I know you're questioning me about jurisdiction, and right. I know that jurisdiction, I respect the fact that jurisdiction is always open in this court. I respect that. Well, but and, there's and no we, question about As much it. as we want to decide a case, if we don't have jurisdiction, well, we can't. But in this case, the, the, the first district said it made its decision in this opinion, the 18 opinion, not the 14 opinion, based on the language of the Constitution. The first line of the state's summary of the argument is that this case turns on an interpretation of the state Constitution. So the court, uh, I think to answer your question, the court, this, the court actually denied an injunction because it didn't agree with us on the merits. The court reached the merits all over again. Let me, Let make me ask you, I, I have to ask you one other question because you, uh, you just said that if there's an intervening election, that makes the difference. So 
if Judge Foster had sent the same letter and um, said, I am resigning as of October 31, 2018, six days before the election, this would be an appointed seat. You would agree to that? Yes, I would. Yes, I would, uh, Justice So, it, so I, in your mind, it all turns on whether or not there is, in fact, an election between the, the yes, before the date of the resignation. Yes, Your Honor. And that's not just in my mind. That's what Specter says. And it says also that the only reason to make an interim appointment is the emergency of the public business. Now, I would ask you, is four days, is it really, are we really going to say we have to appoint somebody for four days? And if I could make just one final point, I'm actually over just very, one second. quickly. Yes, I will. Specter says that if there is any doubt, that the will of the people have to be upheld. And so if you go back to the conference room and you're having trouble with it, I suggest to you that the answer is that this should be an election and that you should quash the decision of the district court. Thank you. Thank you. We thank you both for your arguments. We'll now move forward to the second case on today's docket, Brown versus the state.